Well, I'm from San Diego originally. I went to art school in Oakland, and I moved to New York to be a cartoonist and illustrator. Met uh, my husband there, and he worked on Pee Wee's Playhouse. And right after that, it seemed like L.A. was the place to be for him to get more work in Mm -hmm. television doing production design. Uh, We were thinking about starting a family, and my family is in San Diego, and... Neither one of us had a lot of enthusiasm about trying to raise a family in New York City. We're both kind of from the suburbs, so this made the most sense. Was the plan for you to to get into television as well? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to do... I had written an ep- that episode of The Simpsons, and mm-hmm. I wrote an episode of Pee-wee's Playhouse, and at the time I thought I wanted to write for television. And I just wasn't prepared for how difficult a proposition that was. Yeah. <laughs> especially being a woman, um, writing for television. And it just, it also didn't uh, coincide well with having children. Because like when you work in television, they want you to be there for like crazy hours. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was, you know, at the time, maybe things have changed since then. But in the 90s, it just wasn't a good fit for, you know, I wanted to be with my kids. I didn't want to like hand my kids off to a nanny. And I, I didn't want it so bad that I was willing to do that. So that kind of went by the wayside. So it was a situation where in order to really kind of commit yourself to being a television writer, you would have to be in the writer's room? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, like they, they start at, at nine or 10. It's not like sometimes they amble in around 11 a.m. and they work until three in the morning, yeah. you know, and it wasn't working for me. So... Yeah, you know, and then like on taping days, I, I worked. I worked for three months on the last season of Designing Women uh, when my son was six months old, and it was, it was just the worst thing I could have done to myself. What was bad about that well, specifically? Um, I mean, that's a grind. Like they were doing what twenty-two ev- episodes a year or something. Yeah, like that? everything had had gone south. Linda Bloodworth was off winning the election for Bill Clinton. The inmates were running the asylum. They were making all kinds of wonky decisions about the characters it really didn't make that much sense the nobody really wanted to be there all the good ideas had been done you'd like i'd be like i i was completely sleep deprived i'd never worked on a tv show before i'd never worked in an office before and i'd like you know search my my sleep deprived brains for ideas and i'd pitch them and they go oh did that in season two did that in season three did that in season four and you're like fuck and i just was like so you sort of started when it was on its way out? Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote one episode, or I got credit for one episode. I wrote it, and then they completely rewrote it, which is what they do. That's what happens in, you know, in in television. Is like, that's why there's a team of writers. They take your script, and they just take it apart and put it back together again. So that experience specifically, I mean, it sounds like you came on at, like, the worst possible time. Yeah, it, yeah. It just soured you it to really television writing? It really soured me, yeah. And then Wayne and I pitched show ideas for, like, until we were blue in the face. What? You know, the 90s was still like the last gasp of network television before cable, you know, got big. And there's a whole really antiquated hierarchy. You really could only create a show if you'd been a showrunner, if you'd been working on shows for years and years. And no, But nobody told us that. You know, we had these dipshit agents who would just like send us to meeting after meeting. And we kind of had like heat around us because he'd been on The Simpsons. I mean, he'd been on Pee Wee and I'd been with The Simpsons. And, they, you know, it was just a complete waste of time. It was just garbage. You've got Pee Wee. He's working on Pee Wee. You've got Matt Groening, a cartoonist, has his own network television show. Gary Panthers uh, doing a lot of the stuff for, for, for Pee Wee's. Was there a point when it felt like maybe there was a shift that was going to happen? Not really. I mean, with with Matt, it was just an anomaly. It was this yeah. window that opened like a crack, and he got through, and no one else got through. I mean, there were like there were a, a lot of of pretenders after that. Like they yeah. were just throwing shit against the wall. There were a lot of bad stick. cartoons. Of really, Fox. really yeah. bad. Now you know it seems like every cartoonist is getting a deal on Netflix, except for me. <laughs> now, no, I yeah. mean I. I I mean, I'm working on stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, so, so so given sort of the all of the, the the new options that have sprung up over the past like five to ten years, do do you feel like there might be an opening for you again? Yeah, yeah, there might. Although you know, now that I'm old, <laughs> it's like ageism re- re- rears its yeah. doddering, ugly head. Yeah. So you moved to New York to be a cartoonist. Uh-huh. You were out in Oakland. Obviously, you were close to San Francisco in the you know in, in the 70s. I mean, wouldn't. Wasn't that a good spot to... No. no? 
I mean, underground cartoonists never made any money. That's why they were like, they got old and bitter by the time they were in their mid thirties. I always thought they started off bitter. Well, that's because, that's because <laughs> Robert Crumb set the bitter bar. He sure did. And yeah. then, and then all, all the dudes that came along yeah. after him had to be bitter too. And I, I knew Crumb and I knew Spain and I knew Justin Green and I knew Bob Armstrong and they all kind of tried to model their, themselves after him. Like they all had to be cynical and bit embittered, you know, and, and and it didn't serve them well. And I like I looked at them. I'm working in this restaurant, killing myself, waitressing. And I'm like, I don't want to be bitter. I'll, I'll sell out. I don't care. I'll like do some illustration work. Just like get me out of this job. You know, like screw that. I mean, like this is just macho posing thing anyway. I could see that then. And you know, they really didn't do themselves any favors. They just kind of bittered themselves off into the corner. Except for Crumb, who just like you know had the chops and the talent and the and the reputation, and just waited long enough for the you know the world to beat a path to his doorstep, which they finally had the sense to do because he's a genius. So there's no denying that. But you know, it's like the 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 reigning attitude is like, what, like why even try? The world's a rotten place. Yeah. <laughs> The man's going to get you. And that's got to be a kick in the face when you're struggling as a waitress and trying to make a career as a cartoonist, like seeing all these more yeah. successful people be completely miserable with their well, life. Well, I mean, the other model was that the Lampoon was still going at that point. And there was a, you know, there was a big comic scene in the, in the Lampoon. So that's how I got my stuff published originally was at the Lampoon, which had a, uh, Sherry Flanagan, the cartoonist, was the cartoon editor and a big supporter of women artists. Yeah. So that was a huge stroke of luck for me because otherwise it's just like the, you know, the, the boys club <laughs> just relentless that was really important to me she was a, a a great mentor to me and could not have been more wonderful and supportive and encouraged me to move to new york and let me stay in her apartment and and introduce me to people and you know i came to new york and i was able to get work almost right away and then um uh, I was there for about eight months and I got the opportunity to do, to sell out again and do the Valley, Valley Girl's Guide to Life. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that because <laughs> it's better than waitressing. In terms of like a professional career, what did New York offer that, you know, San Francisco or LA didn't? I mean, it was the center of publishing where there was yeah. magazines were yeah. all and newspapers were all there. I mean, you just don't have that in, in LA or San Francisco and it was, everything was there. So like you physically took your portfolio in to see art directors at all these magazines that were there. And you were, I mean, I was working all the time. I was getting 80s money. I mean, I was being paid well. Money from, you know, that yeah. they had because they were magazines that were successful and had lots of advertising and paid people, you know, living wages. You know, not just because it was a real world in which you could make a living. I know that seems fantastic. <laughs> As somebody who's been scrounging for like 15 years in New York at this point, it's sort yeah. of crazy to no, think No, I mean, I, you know, I made a good living. You know, you like do, a, you know, a, a spot illustration for 300 to $500, mm -hmm. a half a page to a page for 800 to, you know, 1500 a double two-page spread for 2000 I mean, life was good. There, there seems to be sort of a, an interesting relationship with artists around that time and newspaper strips. Obviously, like everybody came up reading all these strips, and then that was kind of a steady way to make money. Well, the syndicate, the newspaper syndicate, that, that's a whole different thing. Was that not something no, that you were interested no, in? No, no, no. I mean, I'm talking about magazines. Sure. Like, you know, yeah. Red Book and, and uh, New York Magazine and Ad Week and these magazines that aren't even around anymore. The syndicates were a, a, a complete, like... That was just a complete fuck job. I mean, you're supposed to, like, kill yourself to, like, create a strip and, and grind out, like, months' worth of strips to prove to them that you yeah. can do it. And then if they decide they want to run it, then they've, like, got all these newspapers across the country. I mean, it was worse than network television in terms of being edited and... and, and Probably even harder told, to break in, too. Yeah, well, yeah, and told what to do and what not to do and what would offend their readers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had to be really bland. And they, they, it was like the company store, like they'd charge you against the money that you got from each newspaper. They'd charge you for making stats and for postage, for sending the stats to, to the newspapers to, to the, I mean, they just kept, you know, taking, to take things out of your paycheck that you pay for and not them. And so that was like, I, I met, you know, people at King syndicates and, you know, a, a few other places and I was like this is 
this is no. Yeah. <laughs> this is not what I want to do. It, it was something though at some point you were like potentially seeking out. No, no, no. You just happened to meet some people in that world. Yeah, and I thought, well, you know, let's see if I could do that. And the more I examined it, the more yeah. I could see it was not my thing. You had to really bland it down for the kind of mass consumption. At what point did it really occur to you that comics were something that you could potentially do professionally? I don't know. When I was a kid, my father was an amateur cartoonist, mm. and I, they just said, you're you're a cartoonist. And like, I just grew up thinking, well, yeah, I'm a cartoonist. You had those like, rare, supportive parents. Yeah. I mean, I think they thought it was cute to say that. And then like once I finally said, yeah, I'm going to be a cartoonist, they'd go, oh, I mean, maybe you should think about advertising. I'm like, no, you said... You said I could. <laughs> you like plant the seed early and expect that like there's going to be sort of some sort of professional divergence. From oh, there. you know, I mean, it was it was something you could make a living, and I did make a living. You know, up until everything fell off the cliff with yeah. the internet, and there was the big the big thing in the '80s was humor books that whole like, and I I rode that wave as far as it would go. Why not? The point in your life when you were waitressing in Oakland is something that you've you know come back to. I mean, it's been the basis of the last two. Mm -hmm. graphic novels what 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 is it about that point in your life that's been so kind of fruitful for you well it was really it was really i mean it was you know the 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 day i went to work in this restaurant i knew it was the story that i would have to tell one day it just Mm. sort of lodged itself in me i knew i didn't know what the story was but i knew it was something that was going to be important yeah i you know i just thought about it for years and years trying to figure out what what the hook was and i finally figured it out it you know it was a really important part in my life is sort of, you know, coming of age and figuring out who I was and who I wasn't and what I was willing to put up with and what I wasn't willing to put up with. And it's kind of job where you like, you could easily get stuck working there for a long time. And you I was, probably were working with people who were oh, stuck yeah, there. Yeah. And I was terrified that I was going to wind up stuck there. And so it was like, I was just like constantly worried that I was going to get stuck and I was fighting against that all the time and and trying to be disciplined about, you know, making a plan to get out. The restaurant manager who the story is about, the real, I was very supportive of me and my, you know, my dream to do something more. And he was a brilliant writer himself. And he kind of got just got eaten up by the place. Does feeling like you constantly have to get out? I mean, does that make you less focused on the the job of waiting tables? No, I mean, I was, you know, I was good at what I did. It would, yeah. you know, it didn't take that much. It's just doing it full time was the kind of thing that could really drive you into the ground. I once I cut back to part time, it was a lot easier to take. It's like, you know, you just start to hate people, but like they walk in the door and you're just like, I hate you. Hate you. You're regardless of anything. Yeah. How old were you at that point? You know, in my early twenties. Okay, so that's like exactly the point where you have like enough energy to yeah work right. this job and then sort of like go home and continue to be yeah. creative. Right. So you were going to art school at the same time? Is that- no, oh, okay. I was after art school. I I went to art school for three years yeah. on scholarships and loans and and grants, and they pulled the plug on that, and I was like, well, you know, I'm kind of done anyway. <laughs> like, I just need to get a degree from a Bachelor of Arts degree. I mean, yeah. It really wasn't going to get me anything to have the degree. You know, I didn't want to teach, never wanted to teach. Uh, and I just was like, you know, I'd, I'd had I'd had like a year prior to that. I'd had like a year and a half of dicking around in community college anyway. So I was kind of done. You felt like you had learned everything that you needed to know in terms yeah, of being. Yeah, I was ready to be done with it. You know, it was like it was feeling like I'm in an ivory tower situation. Yeah. I've got to get out into the real world. I might as well, you know, cut the cord and get out there. I had that situation where after I, I graduated college, I I ended up moving back home for half a year and working working at a bunch of retail jobs, and it's and it's hard not to feel like you know even even at that early stage in life like you're kind of like a failure it just it hasn't paid off was that a rough time creatively for you i was trying to you know make myself work i was also doing these pastel drawings of mm. of buildings in oakland uh, i really love the quality of the light there and the way that stucco buildings would absorb light and kind of glow so i was i was making these drawings so i'd sit in my car with a big drawing board and do these drawings from life of these uh, you know these different houses and apartment buildings, and there really was this couple that yeah. w- that were like um, my customers who started buying my artwork. That was kind of like a big cash infusion that that helped me finally like get out of there. And I had started I had started selling stuff to the Lampoon, and Sherry Flanagan said you can. I had, I actually went to visit New York a couple of times uh, before I moved there. I 
was showing my portfolio around and it was clear that like I could get work and I was finally able to, mm -hmm. to do it. I found like through an illustrator who did covers for the New Yorker, who I met at a, a cartoonist lunch in New York, I found a sublet. And so it's just like, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> was there ever a, a plan B at that point? I mean, New York then and New York now is different, but I found that like most people, when they uproot their lives and move to New York, there's always sort of like a, in, in the back of their brain. What I never happens? thought of anything no. else. I really didn't. I mean, that's the beauty of being young and dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Having a plan B in a situation like that is actually ultimately kind of I was of actually mistake. like down to my last few hundred dollars when I got the opportunity to do the Valley Girls Guide to Life. I didn't even know what Valley Girls were. I, I had lunch. I had done, been doing, I did a, a couple full page cartoons for the Village Voice where I also had a tremendous <clears throat> mentor in a, an editor there named Mary Peacock who did this, the V page, which was a style page. And she let me have a whole page of the village voice which is like like getting a free ad for yourself yeah and so I was and this getting, was pretty early on yeah in career. this is like 1982 and i got a call from a an editor at dell books and i went to lunch with him and i was just goofing around and like t talking about growing up in san diego and you know like how i went to like high school with like 10 spicolis <laughs> <laughs> like these guys they just like hey man we should go catch some waves and he's like, you know, uh, we, they say, we want to do a humor book about Valley Girls. I was like, what's that? He's like, well, it's a song by Frank Zappa. I had to go buy the album. I didn't have a record player. I had to go to a friend's house and listen to it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that I can do that. Were you able to just like bullshit your way through essentially a job interview at that point? Yeah, I was like, well, let me listen to it. And I was yeah. like, I listened to it. And I was like, I called him. Said, yeah, I can do that. I mean... <laughs> It, yeah, it was that. It was that simple. Yeah, and I was like, took me like I I flew back out to L.A. and like went to the Sh Sherman Oaks Galleria and I walked along the beach and I talked to teenage girls and I took notes and I you just, were embedded. Yeah, I, as they as they say now. You soaked in this culture and you were able to just sort of try yeah. It. it was you know it was like teenage girls. They have they the, the teenage girls always have teenagers in general always have their own slang. So yeah. it's just. The way teenagers are talking right now, it's funny. And also it was like, uh, just like teenage girls don't really get paid much attention to most of the time because they're girls mm -hmm. and like nobody cares. And so it was nice to just like focus on teenage girls just being teenage girls. Yes, yeah. I mean, especially pre-internet. I, I yeah. suspect that like yeah. things have changed now to some degree and that all these social media, this is, this is the demographic that kind of everybody yeah. wants to go out after now. And you were sort of at the forefront of it yeah. in a way. Yeah, so it became a bestseller, you know, and, and suddenly I had enough money to, to rent a decent apartment. So you do that and it's a bestseller and was it just like, all right, well, I guess this is what I'm doing now for a while. Yeah, you know, I mean, the market was just ripe for humor books. I mean, mm. you could just like sell anything, seriously. <laughs> Does that mean that cartooning sort of goes on the back burner for a little while? No. I mean, there, there were illustrated humor yeah. books. So okay. it was all, it was comics with words. You know, I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't, I did five humor books. There's the Secrets of the Powder Room. That was all comics. And then I did um, Shoes Never Lie, which was about women in shoes. So that was like text with illustrations. So no, I mean, it's all, all the drawings all there. How long had you been planning on working on sort of like a fully fledged graphic novel for? I had originally written the story for that i i had like reached this this point where i was ex you know my, my career had fallen off a cliff in the in the late night by the mid 90s and i couldn't get arrested i couldn't get anything going on and then i thought well i'll you know i, I thought about the different ways in which i could approach the story and my my first dream was to do it as a movie and then i would lived here long enough to know to realize that like even if you wrote a script the chances of it getting made were like slim to none it's like well okay i'll just i'll just write it as a conventional piece of fiction so i did that and my agent couldn't sell it and I finally had to break down and admit to myself that a, a graphic novel is really what it wanted to be and that's what I do and that's like I can like I could see it all in my mind why anyway. was that as, as again because as somebody... it's so much work okay god <laughs> so much goddamn work because I my first thing was like well I couldn't do that. no one could do that much drawing that's just crazy it's one of those things that's like right there in front of you the whole time this is yeah. something that you've been wanting to pursue for such well then you know I had I had young children yeah. and and it was really daunting I mean, it was really daunting. And finally, like, I, thought, I went, went, but 
I like to draw. When the kids came along, did you find yourself having to sort of put the job on the back burner for? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really hard. Yeah, having children is really hard. Those two things sort of seem to, to dovetail with you know that that sort of lull in your career and, and having kids. Was it just sort of taking yourself out of circulation yeah, for a little while? Yeah, and then you know finally the thing is is like I was really miserable and I finally realized like you know it's the it's the same old story of mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy yeah. and you know your kids are really important for your kids to see that you have an identity outside of just being their mother and that you have you know a life and you have things you do and you have to model that behavior for them and so i just had to like insist on like like just fighting for a certain amount of time to have to myself to do things mm-hmm. I imagine being married to an artist is helpful from the standpoint of him sort of like understanding yes. that you're dealing no, with at no, all times. No, he's very supportive, but, you know, I mean, he's the one making the money, so it's on me to kind of like manage everything yeah. else. But I also have to like manage to like put my foot down and say, I'm going to spend this amount of time doing yeah. this. Uh, so so at what point sort of in earnest do you actually start on the book? Really not till about 2009, 2010. And then like, John and Quarterly would call me up and go, like, when do you think you can have this done? And I'd be, like, just speechless. I'd just be, like, sitting on the other end of the line going, stand, sitting there with my mouth open, like. And finally, they said, well, let's let's split it into two volumes yeah. to make it more manageable. And that really helped. The original pitch was essentially for a 700-page book. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know how long it was going to be. I had yeah. no way of knowing without actually doing it. How much does that sort of like change the the math of actually sitting down and creating that first book when you realize that you only have finished line is essentially that much closer? Well, they never really had a set deadline. Yeah. There's a difference between sitting down and trying to write a 700 page book or however long a story took to, to tell versus splitting it in two. I mean, that I, I assume that that makes it slightly less daunting when you actually yes, have to sit down and work yeah, on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of just like looked through the manuscript I had and realized like the you know the the first one is shorter than the second one but it just seemed like the logical stopping place yeah so there were, there was a clear essentially delineation between the two books well no I mean to me it's just all one story but with it made sense where to end the yeah, first one and... I guess you had said earlier that, that you had the story in the back of your head and you were kind of looking for the hook so what what exactly was the hook death I'm not gonna say who because for people who haven't read the book but I was like someone died and I went oh that's the story it's kind of a depressing i mean but... i don't want to i don't want to give yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no spoiler alerts but it wasn't even so much the the fact of you figuring it out but it was that like certain storylines had to kind of play themselves out in real mm-hmm. life yeah i mean all told this was what 2009 to when did you officially end 13 it was when i was finished with over easy and it was published in 2014 and then i just i had to just start right up on part two yeah. so but by that point my both my kids were away were out of the house and in college or and you know or out of college and i like i had my life back yeah. and i could make it my full-time job for once in your life it, it's clear what the next job is yeah you, know, you finish yeah. that one and, and this one yeah. is lined up so you go straight yeah. into it do you feel like you or have you started throwing yourself into the next work i started researching uh, a graphic novel about the Mitford sisters who were six sisters born of an aristocratic family in England born between 1906 and 1920 who all bec- they were all very eccentric and they all went off to do very interesting th- uh, and dramatic things and they knew everyone and they went everywhere and uh, wildly disparate things uh, one two of one became Hitler's number one groupie seriously and another one married Oswald Mosley, who was the head of the British Union of Fascists. Uh, the, another one became a, a staunch communist. Like at 12 and 14, she's like, well, I'm a communist. And her sister's like, well, I'm going to go meet Hitler. Everyone did what they said they were going to do. Another, another one said, well, I'm going to marry a duke. And she did. She didn't even know it at the time. But his older brother died in World War II. And he and she became the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire, which is this like crazy massive pile bigger than Versailles. This like gigantic historic English house. It's like 500 rooms or something. It's nuts. The oldest one, Nancy, became a very successful comic novelist. Hmm. Um, and they knew everyone from Cecil Beaton to Evelyn Waugh. And they were 
cousin was Winston Churchill. I mean, they just, they, they didn't have the money that a lot of the aristocrats had, like, and they were told from an early age that there was no money for them. And their father was like pissing it away in, in, you know, really quick. And, and they were all educated at home because he didn't believe in educating girls. So they're kind of like raised by wolves in Uh a way. And no one, it was like, I think my theory is that because they didn't experience like girls boarding schools and they didn't experience being socialized in the usual way in which girls are said told you can't do this and you can't do that and girls don't do this and girls don't do do, don't do that so they just did whatever they wanted to do was it almost sort of like a great garden situation where they were from money but no no it was i mean but they they their their circumstances kept kept reducing they went from (laughs) They went from the father inherited this massive pile that his father had built, uh, who was the first. He wasn't a duke, and he was he an earl. His father had had spent a fortune building this enormous Victorian pile that that his son could yeah. not afford to keep. And he sold that, and they moved into a very nice country manor house. And, he, and then he decided, no, that wasn't good enough. He was going to take his money and build them a nice new house, which they all hated. And then he couldn't afford to keep that, and they ultimately wound up living in this little house in the village that he once was once like his ancestral fiefdom but that said they still had enough money to rent a six-story townhouse in london for years and years just so that they could see six daughters through being uh, debutantes because that was the whole system is it with with the upper classes is like you did the debutante season you turn 18 yeah. you did the debutante season you're like beef on the hoof you're like out there to meet all the other eligible upper class dudes and you know make a good marriage and pump out the babies so they had all these like very like state expectations yes for these sex yes days. yes uh they did and and all of, and the other thing about the mitford sisters is they all had brilliant senses of humor and they all wrote beautifully and they wrote really funny acerbic letters to one another all of which have been published there's been a lot written about them um there's there was even a a a musical about them that didn't do well but there's never been any graphic novels about them you talk about daunting taking on six sisters and trying to weave together these stories sounds yeah it is i mean but i've learned a lot about about the British aristocracy, for one thing, holy shit! Like this tiny percentage of the population has so much money, yeah. and everyone else is just like gets the crumbs. What That's they- sort of another thing I think we can relate to now. <laughs> yeah, in yeah. The current climate. So I was, you know, I was working on that, and then I've just been distracted doing yeah. a lot of shorter pieces for. Like I did a, a, I don't know if you saw the cartoon I did for the LA Times mm. this summer. I um, it was published on well, part of it was in the paper, but most of it was online because it was like thirty six panels about Zsa Zsa Gabor's uh, estate auction, which I went to the preview for at her oh. house in Beverly Hills and got to meet her her husband, the fake Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. No, this guy is like such a con artist. <laughs> He was unbelievable. And he was so unbelievable. And so and he's twenty five years younger than she was. And so unafraid of uh, you, you can't embarrass the guy. I mean, he just loves any kind of attention. He he um he tweeted my, a link to my cartoon on his Twitter page, his Twitter feed, because he was like just happy to have the attention. And it Depressed. just makes him look horrible. I remember when that documentary about Roger Stone came out um, a year or so ago. He he was yeah. all into it. It was yeah. like the least flattering portrait of him, but he was just excited. Yeah, to have, yeah, the exact yeah. exact same kind of person. It's interesting. I mean, it sounds like doing that first that the, the Valley Girl book really. I mean, at at the heart of what you do, you know, especially that piece and the the book that you're working on now it is kind of journalism yeah it's fun i mean i i don't like to i I can't really do subjects that are like super timely and like have to like get out there's just no time to well and drawing takes yeah a while but with you know there's certain topics that are kind of evergreen yeah (laughs) what's interesting to me about the story of, of these sisters is you know it I mean, do you have to, especially the sister who ends up like hanging out with Adolf Hitler, do you have to sort of paint her as an empathetic character? Oh, well, no, you don't. Um, but she had a tragic end. She, in 1939, well, <laughs> I mean, she was so into it. She was very eccentric and very immature. And she was about 20, how old was she? Uh, 
like 22 or so mm -hmm. when when Britain finally declared war on Germany in 39 and she was in Munich and she went to the park with her little gun and tried to shoot herself in the head but she just she just gave herself brain damage yeah. and then she lived another nine years back at home with her mother so she and Jessica who was who was the communist who became a, a brilliant a uh, muckraking journalist mm. who wrote a very important book called the, the American Way to Death that was an expose of the American funeral industry that came out in the early 60s, made her a lot of money. She also worked for uh, civil rights and for, for um, labor union causes. Her husband was a, a, a lawyer for, for labor unions, yeah. and they lived in Oakland. And I, she was alive when I lived there, and I never knew it. I, I was like, kills me that she was right there. So she and um, um, Unity... The Hitler's little buddy were on uh, complete opposite sides from each other. Sure, um, but they were very, very close. Jessica couldn't make her husband understand that, and so they would like write to each other in secret. And she was very sad when she died. It, it's the funniest thing. Now that you have you know those those two out in the world, and you're sort of you know starting in on this thing. I mean, is it just? It sounds like any sort of initial pushback you might have had against diving into a graphic novel novel has sort of no it's a lot you know i mean i've learned a lot and i now i know what's involved so yeah. it's not as daunting as well but i mean it's just structuring this story is a whole different thing so it's daunting in that way why, why does this specifically make sense as a comic i don't I mean I, because i think visually it'll be fun and also there's a whole um d demographic of of women when you say I'm gonna do a graphic novel about the Mitford sisters they just have a fit they're like ah! a positive fit yes okay. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> like there's a big fan base around the Mitford sisters among women uh you know from their 20s to their yeah. 80s I mean I mean it's a it's a kind of story about women that other women really love you know you mentioned that it been the subject of a more or less failed musical why why do you feel like it it hasn't necessarily been adapted successfully up till now. Oh, there was a mini series. There okay. was a British mini series in the around two thousand. Uh, it, it was um, based on on Nancy Mitford's book Love Love in a Cold Climate. That's which is and all her comic yeah. novels are kind of based on her family to begin with. I tried watching it and it was just awful. I mean, maybe maybe it was a hit in Britain when it aired. There. Yeah, it, it wasn't like I'm sure British miniseries don't age particularly well well i don't mean yes and no i mean there's also brad's head revisited yeah i mean yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah it's got all the same markings sure just a little like melodramatic kind of heightened and well you know it's also it's like the downton abbey you know it's like middle-aged lady porn yeah. there is this weird kind of attraction repulsion thing where you're like oh to be like yeah. you know downton abbey and your servants bring you the newspaper and it's been ironed for you so it's nice and crisp and they bring you your your you know your tea, and they you know hang up your clothes, and they help you get dressed, and you're thinking, no, that you like. There's part of me that just wants to be the biggest Stalinist. <laughs> Go no. There you go. That was a great Mimi Pond recorded that at her home in Los Angeles on a recent trip out there. Her two books, Over Easy and The Customer Is Always Wrong, can be purchased through Drawn and Quarterly. Thanks so much to her for taking the time to do that. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts. We're on Spotify and YouTube now. Anywhere where you happen to get podcasts, like us on Facebook. If you have any feedback, it's rlcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rlcast.tumblr.com. That's the first and best place to get all of your RIYL-related information. And that's about all we got for this week, so stick around, because we are going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of R.I.Y.L. 